Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today, we are encountering a surprise visit for air from two Asuras, so sit back and relax. Chapter 3. Little People, Big Projects. Hello? Hello? The black direwolf raised his head from the warm blanket and blinked at the workshop doorway. No one was there. Hello? Hello? Air shifted on her bed, lifting a tangle of red hair to look toward the door. She didn't see anyone either. The voice spoke again. Nobody's home. Another voice answered. Maybe they're sleeping in. Sleeping in? Are you crazy? The greatest Norn artist of her generation isn't sleeping in. Well, she's probably working. Famous sculptor and all, she's probably off carving something. She's not working. This is her workshop, isn't it? Yes, it is, said Aerstug Gawkin, rolling out of bed and standing, and her bedroom. She looked toward the door and blinked. Oh, there you are. Garm quirked his eyebrows and stood also, seeing at last two little people standing in the doorway. They came up only to the belt of a Norn, and they were gray, with giant ears swept back from their childlike faces. One was male, dressed in a great coat over a buttoned-up vest and brown trousers. He wore two large gauntlets with gems hovering over the backs of them. The other figure was female, decked in bluish body armor that looked jury-rigged as if she changed its dimensions constantly. Despite their strange voices, they looked intently serious. Oh, there you are, said the slightly taller creature. Air still gawkin, I presume. I'm Master Snaff of Radasum, a Sura genius. I've been told you're the best. Told by whom? Air asked. A Sura. Of course they would be a Sura. Short, smart, and irritating. Snaff smiled, bowing. I cannot reveal my sources. The younger Asura shot him an annoyed look, as if he often revealed his sources. Unperturbed, Snaff continued. This is my associate Zoja, genius in training. She also bowed, but her scowl only deepened. We've come for a commission, Snaff said. I'm not accepting commissions, Air replied. The little man wandered into the workshop, glancing, side along at the statues that towered all around. Really? What are all these, then? I mean, I'm no longer accepting commissions. Garm trotted up behind the male Asura, who reached only his shoulders. The wolf snuffled the creature's great coat, which smelled of swamp water and fern spores. Snaff seemed none too concerned with having a big black wolf hounding his steps. Well, that's a shame. An artist of your caliber no longer taking commissions. There are only three possible reasons. One, that you are retired, which clearly you cannot be given your age and the bits of stone and wood all over your floor. Two, that you somehow have gone haywire, which your hair does seem to indicate. I just got up. Or three, that you have found your subjects of late unworthy of your genius, which, judging from this rogue's gallery of puffed up posers, I would guess to be the reason. You have guessed well, little master. Air stepped into a pair of trousers and drew them on beneath her nightshirt. I am tired of watching fools go to their deaths. Snaff smiled, spreading his hands. We're not fools. But she just said she liked fools, said the apprentice. I didn't. Soja dragged a finger through a pile of shavings on the floor. You said you are tired of watching fools go to their deaths. If you hated them, you would never tire of this. Ergo, you must like them. You may have something there, Air conceded. Well, then I suppose, Snaff replied, looking askance at his apprentice, I would be wise to say that we are fools, except that fools aren't wise, in which case my apprentice's inquisitiveness has once again landed us in a conundrum. Once again, Zoja said pridefully. A grin was fighting its way onto Air's face. Hypothetically speaking... I love hypotheses, Snap broke in. If I were taking commissions, 
whose image would you want? Snaff's grin grew from Air's own. My assistance, of course. Air looked at the petulant young Asur and asked, Why? Snaff shrugged. She's got a good head on her shoulders, and that's all I want. A head and shoulders. Well, Air said, that's a pretty small statue. I'm a pretty big statue maker. Maybe you'll want to find a smaller sculptor. Except that her head needs to be five times taller, Snaff said. Zoe just shot him a look of annoyance. I suppose that is a commission worthy of my talents. But it'll cost you. Twenty silver. A bargain, said Snaff, reaching beneath his great coat to grasp a bag on his belt. This will be a bust in stone, of course. In wood, of course, Eric clarified. It'd be twenty gold for stone. Ah, said Snaff, reaching to the other side of his belt. Then gold it will be. Twenty, did you say? He opened the bag, a pile of coins shimmering within the burlap. Air's eyes widened as she peered at the bag. She snagged her leather apron, mallet, and the chisel belt, and led the way outside into the courtyard. The others followed. She guided them along her stock of bowls and boulders. This one is granite, which is very hard. This one is marble, too expensive in this case. Here, we have columnar basalt. This is limestone. Basalt! exclaimed Snaff. That's volcanic rock, yes? Yes, said Air, standing beside a large great chunk, and this one is particularly dense. Perfect for depicting my student. Zoja hit him. Air cocked an eyebrow at Zoja. You should show more respect for your master. Snaff rubbed the spot she had hit and smiled tightly. Most of her assistants get brown beaten by their masters. With Zoja, it's the other way around. Why do you put up with it? Air asked. Zoja glared. I'm not sure if that's your business, giant kin. Air stared back. Your master might put up with your abuse, but I will not. Now, now, said Snaff, chuckling lightly. It's quite flattering to have you two fight over me. Both women gaped at him in amazement. I think I understand, said Air to Zoja. Snaff just beamed. Well, good then. All things are mended. Let's get started. Zoja, why don't you stand over there in the light? Yes. Excellent. And of course, Air, you know where to stand, and I'll step out of the way so that neither of you can hit me. Air stepped up before the block of basalt, drew a large chisel from her belt, set it to the stone, and lifted the mallet above her head. Whoa! Guide my hands! She brought the mallet down, shearing off a chunk of the stone. Basalt was a tricky medium, formed of cooled lava. The question was how it cooled. Quickly beneath the ocean or slowly on land. Land was better. This particular stone had come from the throat of a long dead volcano. It had cooled slowly and it was amorphous, without striations. As air worked into the block, she sensed it had no hidden faults or fissures that could split her work. It was solid. As was her model, this annoying little creature had a solid will. She held her nose up and remained still, seeming to sense the importance of this moment. Air worked the stone to bring forth Zoja's features. That lemon-shaped head, those great eyes, her button nose, her small, determined mouth, her perky chin, but hardest of all were those ears. Shaped like a rabbit's but swept back from her forehead, so they seemed almost like small wings. How's it coming? asked the apprentice. Air wished she hadn't moved. Her previous expression had been perfect, focused and slightly proud willful and determined. Now, the lines had shifted to dubious and frustrated. Well, Air replied, could you try to get the old look back? What old look? The look that you are smarter than everyone else, and that they will be shocked when they realize it. Suddenly, the look was back, and Air shifted to a smaller chisel to capture it. Nearby, Snaff idly sized up a floor-to-ceiling drake and alabaster. It's good to be immortalized, my dear. Most apprentices don't make it, you know. He turned toward Air. Maybe you didn't realize that. But they're always handling caustic substances, building precarious mechanisms. Unless they're clever, they just don't make it. And Zoja here is clever? Air asked as she finished the little snarl beneath Zoja's right nostril. She's here, Snaff pointed out. Air stepped back from her sculpture. Yes. I suppose she is. 
In both ways, the likeness is complete. Come see. The two Asura walk toward the sculpture with the numb air of people who cannot believe what they see. Though the statue was five times the actual height of Zoja, it was dead on. Air had captured not only the young Asura's expression, but also her personality. Zoja's look of wonder slowly soured. Why did you have to make me look so big? It's five times actual height, Air replied. Four times would have been enough, Zoja snapped. It's fine. Fine. It's perfect, said Snaff. Thank you very much. It was certainly worth the coin. He turned to his apprentice and said, All right now, let's take this back with us. Zoja scooted to the opposite side of the stone bust. She and her master set their fingers beneath the carving. One, two, three. The two Asura struggled, trying to lift the 500-pound block, but not moving it an inch. Air stood above them, arms folded. Snaff looked up at her and tittered nervously. I wish I had more coin to pay you to carry this. Air smiled. You have more coin. You're about to pay me in silver before I asked for gold. Snaff blushed around a tight-lipped smile. Oh, all right. Never mind, interrupted Air, stepping between the two Asura and wrapping her arms around the huge statue and hoisted it off the ground. Where do you want it? Snaff crooked a finger in her direction and said, Follow me. Garm looked up wonderingly at his alpha. She had never followed anyone. If ever she followed anyone, it would be a creature taller and more powerful and more clever than she. Not some tiny thing. But Air did follow him. Massive bust in hand, Air followed, as did Zoja. Garm joined in, if only to see what this Asura was up to. They paraded out of the courtyard and into the lane. Hey everybody, called Snap into the shops. Look at the new sculpture. Isn't it a masterpiece? Where do you want it? Air repeated as she struggled to carry the bust. Just up here, my lady, Snaff said. They passed into a plaza filled with market tents and tables loaded with fruits, scarves, iron implements, and goods of every other type. In the center of this trading den stood an ancient gate of gray stone carved with strange runes. Just now, the arch gate flickered, and in that flicker gave a vision of another marketplace in a port city. Not going to Lion's Arch today, Snaff said to the gate attendant, another Asura, slipping him a coin. Snaff said, Rat assume if you please. The attendant crouched beside an array of power stones, and a stone in his hand sent sparks leaping into other crystals. The flickering scene in the arch changed to a rocky desert, a mountain lake, a golden meadow. At last, it showed a brief glimpse of what looked like three massive pyramids. Thanks, Snaff said straightening it up and stepping through the portal. Air shrugged and followed, carrying her huge load. Garm came at her heels. Passing through the portals was like plunging into a hot bath. The cold air was ripped away from their skins, replaced by stinging, sticky heat. Instead of wintry skies, there was a blazing sun. Instead of permafrost, there were cut stones and giant leaves. The group stood on a platform that jutted from the side of a huge pyramid. Air staggered to a stop and looked around. Whoa. They stood in what seemed to be a plaza between three gigantic pyramids, except that instead of a plaza, a chasm descended to unseeable depths. Above that chasm, giant stonework cubes seemed suspended on thin air. The lines of massive architecture were softened by palm trees planted in huge rectangular pots and pyramidal lanterns floating over the stone balustrades. Floating? Air gulped. Snaff smiled. Nice, eh? How? Zoja piped up. Even a genius in training knows that. It's all held aloft by power stone fields arrayed using the dodiadic equation of the eternal alchemy. Do decay what? The twelve-fold equation. It's the most obvious expression of universal balance in base twelve. Base twelve? Zoja turned to Snaff and muttered. She must still count on her fingers. He nodded discreetly. It's the temptation of having ten. Air hadn't understood a word, but she did understand that this was a magical place. With purplish plasma flaring up from the columns here and there, and lightning sparking along arched bridges, and power stones glowing everywhere. Isn't that bus getting heavy? Snap asked. Yes, 
If we could just get to the spot. Of course, of course. Snaff strode out in front, his three-toed feet scampering along at a pace that was just a lumbering stroll for air. He led the group down a series of stairs, even deeper into the city. Massive walls of stone rose all around them. I live in the old city, down below. Of course you do. As they walked along one pyramid, an Asura crew swarmed the slanted side, hauling a huge dandelion puff up the incline. One Asura shouted, Nice statue, Master Snaff! A little idol worship, is it? Snaff laughed easily. I appreciate my apprentice. I don't idolize her. Good luck with your test flight. Just let us pass before you launch. Air murmured. Test flight? Test crash, more likely. Master Clav's been working for two years on that puffball. Made of milkweed dander and butterfly scales and a whole lot of hastily cobbled spells. Won't fly, I assure you. But the fellow knows how to glad hand. He never lacks for a crew or investors. On three, came a shot from above. One, two. Let's run, Snap advised, and he and Zoja did, which still mounted to only a fast walk for Aaron Garm. Three, a loud series of pops sounded on the stone slope, sending a blast wave of air across the dandelion puffball. Hundreds of silken sacks inflated, and the thing lifted off the stone slope. The puffball broke free, rising into the air like a floating balloon. At its center, Master Clab hooted excitedly in his harness. Hey ho, Master Snaff! Running from true genius, are we? Whenever there's something clever going on, you're always heading in the opposite direction. The little gray master was looking slightly green as he stopped to stare upward at the flying puffball. He muttered, I'll never hear the end of it. Just then, the puffball rose above the city where a breeze dragged it suddenly away. Master Clab shouted to his crew, Bring the sky hooks! The sky hooks! Air sniffed. Maybe you just did hear the end of it. You're a good lass. Air huffed. Um, can we get on with setting this thing down? Ah, yes, that. Well, see that small ziggurat down there? Snaff pointed toward the bowels of the city at what looked like a temple missing its top. Home sweet home. They descended a series of switchbank stairs and at last arrived at Snaff's ziggurat. He piped happily. Now, it's just up the side, down some stairs, and we'll be in my laboratory. Good, Air said with relief, except that the stairs were made for a certain feat. Air struggled up them to reach the peak of the temple, or what used to be the peak. The top had apparently been blown off by a violent blast, with a single staircase descending into the heart of the ziggurat. Panting, Air paused at the brink of the crater and said, An experiment gone Ari? Snaff pursed his lips. No? Why do you ask? I mean, the crater. He shrugged. It's called a skylight. Saves on candles. Come along. He scuttled down the stairs into the darkness with Zoja close behind. Even Garm pushed past air, apparently to make certain this wasn't a trap. He loped down into the shadows, plunging into a cool chamber with ornately carved walls, tiled floors, and trapezoidal stone tables arrayed across them. Much of the light in the space came through the skylight. Though, some also came from magic lanterns that hung from great chains and sent a bluish glow down over everything. Light also leaked from great vials and beakers and tubes on the tabletops, and from strange mechanical contraptions all around. Oh, much cooler, sighed Air as she reached the floor. Where should I put this? Here, said Snaff, standing beside a table where one of the contraptions sprawled. What an exciting day! Air ambled over to the table and eased the heavy block down. No, lay it down. Yes, on its back. Right, but shove it up against the mechanism here. Excellent, he proclaimed, dragging a great red stone from his pocket and setting it on the forehead of the statue. The stone sank into the forehead, embedding itself and pulsing to life. Wonderful, wonderful, Snaff cried. Metal loops rose from the magical creation that lay there, clamping down on the shoulders of the bust and forming a collar. The machine groaned, pitched forward, and sat up, a towering golem with the head of Zoja. Thank you very much everyone for being here, and I hope that you enjoyed. I apologize that there was a huge delay on this chapter, but it's finally done. 
As always, guys, I'm open to feedback on how I can make this adventure as exciting and as adventurous as possible for you all. Again, my sincerest thanks to you all for listening into this tale. Until next time.